So, um, welcome. My name is Jeanette Jackson. I'm the CEO of Foresight Canada. We are so excited to be announcing the Foresight 50 today. And I promised, because last night's event, I went off script, I'm really going to hold uh, <laughs> this tight um, this evening. Um, the Foresight 50 is all about recognizing some of Canada's most investable companies. And for us, we chose to select a top 50. And we are going to be live streaming this event across Canada with satellite events happening in Calgary and Toronto as well. This is our second year of the Foresight 50 and it really is a comprehensive process of accepting nominations, going through an independent vetting process. So we do not select the winners. It's a group of independent uh, venture capital firms and investment groups uh, that really dig in and, and help us work through that process. Before we get started, of course, we can never move ahead without recognizing the incredible lands on which we live, work, and play. And of course, everyone can read uh, the traditional land acknowledgement. Um, I'd like to take a moment to remind everybody about a new program on television called Bears Lair, which is an indigenous business uh, competition. And if you have not seen it, please go online, Google it, and learn about some of the incredible businesses there that are profiling filing and learning and trying to raise money uh, just like many of you in this room. Um, it's been a busy couple of days so uh, last night we had our uh, a demo day and so we have cohorts happening three times a year we had some companies presenting uh, this morning we had two streams of events we had uh, 50 plus ventures uh, down the street doing some engagement and trading and collaborating and then here we had some presentations from uh, Stephen Pillows, Joshua uh, Passamentier from Congruent Ventures um, we had over a hundred curated matchmaking sessions throughout the afternoon uh, and of course some different panels you know having conversation about why we're all here which is recognizing that climate change is happening we need investments to commercialize and scale the incredible Canadian technologies that are going to be at the forefront of solving a lot of these problems and we cannot do that in silos we have to work together uh, to make that happen so we do have some great speakers I've got with me Jackie Griffiths from Invest Vancouver as well as Christine Bergeron from Van City we're going to have some live pitches and of course you are going to see all of the 50 honorees from this year's Foresight 50 so raise a glass, let's get excited and start with the fun. Uh, none of this would be possible without our partners and uh, the Foresight 50 is powered by Gowling WLG and we'll hear from Gowling in a bit here. Uh, we also want to extend our sincere appreciation to the BDC Climate Fund too. We've got the Clean 50, CoPoint, Invest Vancouver, Platform Calgary, Simon Fraser, and Van City Community Investment Bank. Hopefully I didn't miss any there, I did not. Uh, and of course, uh, NRC IRAP, who supports the innovation community across uh, Canada in so many uh, different ways. Uh, so thank you for your support in supporting all of our uh, clean tech ventures here and across the country. Um, I, I, mean, I feel like everyone knows what Foresight does, but I'd be remiss not to really shout it out. Uh, we've gone through, with the support of an incredible team, quite a bit of growth over the last several years, and we have an ambitious goal. And the ambitious goal is that Canada be the first G7 country to reach net zero. It's intended to be provocative. It's intended to bring us all together and make sure that we're all striving towards that same outcome. Because if Canada can lead in that, the investment opportunities, the export opportunities, it's going to be an incredible transformation of our economy. And we do that as an organization by making sure that the innovation community is supported by industry, academia, government, private capital, and of course all the other communities that are supported uh, through this incredible network. A uh, few of our metrics, um, we're almost at a thousand ventures supported or engaged through our various programs over the last five plus years. Uh, those ventures have gone on to secure over 1.3 billion in capital, trending at well over 350 million in revenue. You can see I, I give this 
spiel a lot, um, over 7,150 green jobs. Uh, and of course, when you factor in uh, all of the ripple effect of all of these investments and, and project deployment, technology deployment, it's well over $2 billion, uh, billion dollars of economic activity um, for Canada. Here we go. Um, so we will jump in and get started. 2022 is the second year that we get to celebrate the Foresight 50. These 50 innovative companies represent hope for our future. These ventures will be of interest to the investment community, including impact investors, potential industry customers, and of course, passionate Canadians seeking meaningful employment. And we encourage everyone to connect with these 50 ventures who I believe 99% are here this evening um, after the formal announcements are made. To kick off the celebration, let me introduce you to Jackie Griffiths, Griffiths the incredible uh, president of Invest Vancouver. Jackie, over to you. Thank you, everyone. Can everyone hear me okay? Just, uh, I'm used to being the last person who speaks before the bar opens. I've never actually spoken as the bar is opening, so I'm treading cautiously. Um, I do want to start in a good way and just building off uh, Jeanette's acknowledgement. Uh, on behalf of Invest Vancouver, I want to acknowledge the 10 traditional territories on whose lands we live, work, and play. I also want to acknowledge the Innu, the Métis, and the urban Indigenous people. And I want to state our commitment at Invest Vancouver to be a part of reconciliation through the economic reconciliation that is possible working with our partners in these communities. Uh, we're thrilled to be here supporting Foresight 50. I can see that I'm in a room full of leaders who truly are the change that we need to see when it comes to climate action. Um, leaders who not only understand the problem, but are actively part of the solution. We are in an era of transformational economic development. And as a region, Metro Vancouver continues to lead in the green economy. Jeanette provided some really important statistics as it relates to what we are doing, um, but we also continue to lower greenhouse gases, and I really do love the aspirational statement in terms of being the first country in the G7 to meet the targets. While we're doing that, though, it's important to remember that we're growing our economy for the residents that we serve. What we want to do is, as these transformations occur, we want to make sure that the investment is coming into the region, that we're building out the opportunities, and with that, creating incredibly high quality, meaningful employment opportunity for our residents to lift them up and propel prosperity. We now make up 7% of the Canadian population, but we account for 30% of the country's clean tech cluster. We place emphasis on innovation and facilitate growth in clean tech, but bold action is still required to help change practices in many industries. And the work that is happening here tonight is the reason that we will be able to facilitate that bold action. Invest Vancouver, with its partners, is here to really build on the foundation and bring about disruptive innovation. Invest Vancouver is Metro Vancouver's region's economic development leadership service. We represent the 21 municipalities and the Tawasin First Nation as part of the Metro Vancouver Regional District Service Model. We are the region's economic development leadership service and what we want to do is make sure that we're also promoting Metro Vancouver on a global stage to attract the right type of investment and make sure that priority sectors such as the green economy stay in the forefront. Um, economic development in the region is very much a part of what it takes to build this strong and robust ecosystem and working together working collectively as a village is the only way we're going to make it happen. An example of this was in September when working with Foresight and in Europe with the, uh, with the Dutch Water Tech Group, uh, we were able to construct and sign off on a memorandum of understanding. This is a partnership that will, collect, that will connect Foresight with the Netherlands-based Water Alliance as well as what is an established and globally recognized ecosystem. In doing this and with this partnership, Canadian water tech firms will be able to pursue greater opportunity and we will be able to build out that stronger and more robust cluster while opening the door to strategic markets in Europe also. 
with challenges like drought, urbanization, and population growth taking hold in parts of the world, it's vital, it's vital that Canada's water tech industry is a part of the global solution. And in doing so, we will create many opportunities within our regions for our residents as well. And so in closing, I just want to say that green innovation is strong and it is here to stay in the Metro Vancouver region. It is also strong in Canada as we work with our partners across the country. We want to make sure that we support clean tech, we want to continue to lead green policy, and we want to make sure that we continue to foster cross-sector collaboration and ensuring that we're investing in talent to support key industries. And with that, it is my pleasure to turn it over to Christine Bergeron, the CEO of Van City, and I welcome you to this second part of, or the, the next part of uh, the event. I'm looking forward to hearing more about the great work that's being done, and I thank you all for being here and being such strong contributors to clean tech and the green economy. Christine. There's a lot more people when you come out from the side. Um, Good afternoon. Thanks uh, so much uh, Foresight Canada for inviting me to this celebration uh, really of some of the most compelling uh, climate solution and clean tech ventures uh, that we have here in Canada. I thought, uh, just thinking maybe not everyone knows Van City. So Van City, we're a values driven uh, credit union based here in BC. We also have a subsidiary bank called Van City Community Investment Bank, so we are related, and that is focused on a smaller business, clean tech projects and affordable housing out of the Toronto area. Um, Van City, we've got 560,000 members, 33 billion in assets and assets under management, um, and really, really focused on, um, you know, seen a better future, uh, both in here in BC and for Canada. So as many of you know, of course, Canada is um, a world leader, you know, in the field. We ranked second in the Global Clean Tech Index last year. But as Canada transitions to a clean and net zero economy, uh, climate and clean tech innovation, of course, are going to be absolutely key to this transition. When I was thinking about what I wanted to say today, you know, I was thinking back to, uh, brought me back 20 years ago, or it was actually a little bit more than 20 years ago, um, when I needed much less sleep and uh, had a lot more air miles to my name, where some of you here would know I actually did venture capital investing uh, in clean tech. And it was the early 2000s, um, and some of you here would have started back then too. So clean tech at the time wasn't really a term. Uh, it was still being coined. And of course, there had been many innovators uh, in the space, but it just wasn't you know, a sector or an industry, and it was coming together. Um, the work that we started here in BC stemmed you know, from the entrepreneurial ecosystem of fuel cell and hydrogen technology that we're still really well known for today, of course, um, and a lot of the spin-off technologies from the great innovators and entrepreneurs that came from those companies doing lots of different things from battery integration to renewable fuels. Um, and the, the question of how I went from venture capital to being the CEO of Hand City is a story for another time, um, but really they actually all link, right? And you know, at the time, I was back and forth uh, from BC uh, to Silicon Valley quite frequently. Um, and the investors to the south at the time were really looking to marry their knowledge of software investment and technology, right, with that of clean tech knowledge. And so we did see some really interesting investments come out, um, software, load management, you know, a lot of those areas more so than perhaps what some would call some of the harder tech um, capital intensive areas. It was also a time when we started to see a lot more money more broadly flowing into clean technology investments globally. And so although it was an exciting time and there was a lot of innovation, there was entrepreneurship being supported and more money flowing into clean tech. You know, what I think was really interesting is that the reality is something fundamental was still missing. Um, even though more money had started to flow in, in the years to come, it was dwarfed by money and capital that was chasing social um, platforms, social networks. And so most of the important global problems were still basically ignored by private capital. And so don't get me wrong, we have absolutely seen some great advances I know the cost curves for solar and wind um, and so many other technologies that we've been able to scale, but we also have seen a huge concentration of wealth be created during this time. And we still have conflict, we still have runaway inequality, and we have a planet that might not be able to sustain us all. 
And so I realized early on uh, that decisions about what gets financed and who gets financed really, really matters. So today, after some ups and downs along the way, you know, clean tech and climate finance is back. Um, unfortunately, it's in part because the climate emergency has gotten worse. Um, and our window of time to reverse it has grown smaller. The extreme weather events that we've seen certainly here in BC, I know others are here across Canada, heat domes, learning new terms like atmospheric rivers. Maybe you knew what that was before last year, but I did not. Forest fires, droughts, you know, and all the other events that we're feeling here locally um, and elsewhere in Canada and the world. And so, although the weather events are costing lives, and livelihoods, they're also causing people, uh, government, and capital providers to pause. More programs are being put together, more capital is being allocated to solutions, both for climate solutions but also for climate adaptation. And we are seeing more um, significant momentum. So this morning, I was on a very early morning call um, with the United Nations Environment Programs Leadership Council that has um, CEOs from insurance companies and pension funds and banks from around the world, you know, getting together to think about how do we reduce our emissions for net zero? You know, the momentum with government programs, new announcements, you know, every week, policies, more capital. Um, there's also, you know, large companies, not-for-profits, individuals, small businesses. There's a lot of momentum everywhere. At least that's what I'm experiencing. And we need all of those stakeholders, all of those people at the table to change the course. And we still need more private capital at the table. Uh, Canada in particular is a great place to invest in clean tech and climate finance. Um, we have 13 of the ca Canadian companies in the Global Clean Tech 100. And the strength and global leadership are diversified across different clean tech sectors. Some of this, this room will know, but I'll say it anyway. Um, we're the only country in the Western Hemisphere that has all the critical minerals uh, required to manufacture EV batteries, with over $4.5 billion invested over the last two years by some of the major auto assemblers to manufacture EVs in Canada. We're the, the world's third largest hydroelectric producer. We're a leader in the development of innovative and, uh, water technologies, strong recycling infrastructure, environmental standards, Again, most of you know it. And so back to 20 years ago, uh, many people said at the time, you know, about investing in clean tech, it's too capital intensive. Can't make money off of that. Can't make good returns off of that. So good returns, traditional return models. Models that didn't or can't, uh, in my opinion, fully incorporate the harm being done to our planet. And arguably, our current models of how the economy should work are a little bit broken. And they're therefore not serving as many of us as they should. Van City, several years ago, we decided to try to rethink some of the models um, as we look to invest in impact funds. So we don't do direct equity investments. We're not well equipped to do that. So unfortunately, we can't invest in many of the great entrepreneurs here today. But our approach was to look at funds um, that were having a broad positive impact um, on our communities. And we have seen a significant increase in the number of investors, uh, the number of funds that are looking for, for money, interest in ESG, people knowing what ESG means, uh, interested in clean tech, and interested in climate solutions broadly. And this is in part why, despite our economic no models not having worked up to date, I am actually quite excited about the next few years. Because every day I'm seeing this momentum gaining and playing out. So all that said, uh, one point I do want to make is that this new economy only being clean and net zero isn't going to be enough. It's a necessary but insufficient uh, perspective uh, that I have, is that the economy is also built on everyday people and needs to serve all of their financial needs. Um, it's, of course, the economy is strongest when it's um, on a sustainable footing where people are financially resilient and confident about the future. And it's also held back, you know, the economy is held back when people are just worried about their day to day, um, let alone thinking about investing for the future. And so if the new clean economy doesn't address the widespread challenge of affordability and resilience, and if again, you know, the wealth that we generate 
becomes highly concentrated in the hands of a small number of people, I think then the net zero transition is not going to be sustainable and we will have failed. One way for clean tech and climate innovation to support that resilience, if you're thinking, well, how, what, what can I do about that? Um, one of the most important promises of the sector, of course, are new jobs and green jobs. And there is real potential for rapid growth in the sector. Again, all of you know this, you're creating jobs every day as you're building out your companies. Um, there's a lot of different stats, you know, as to how many jobs have been created in Canada, uh, from 100,000 to 400,000. But what everyone does agree on is this uh, expectation that the number will grow uh, very rapidly. And most importantly, there are the kinds of jobs that we need. They tend to be well-paying. Uh, they will get the net zero transition right. And at Van City, you know, we, uh, we envision uh, and we work towards a transformed economy that protects the earth and also guarantees equity for all. And so we know that addressing climate change and affordability really need to go hand in hand. Um, you know, we, we really can't be blind, and, and I don't think that, I'm not trying to say that anyone in this room is, to affordability, resilience, and inclusion in the net zero transition today. Um, and so, well-paying green jobs are a critical part of this challenge, um, and especially in places that currently rely on resource industries um, that are going to be hurt the most by this transition. So Canada's clean tech ventures and the sector as a whole certainly have the potential to drive this change. And so we have terrific climate-oriented entrepreneurs here in Canada. There's an ecosystem that supports them, all of you. Uh, we have significant momentum from every stakeholder to make real headway in clean tech innovation. And as we do it, you know, my, my ask is that we ensure that these climate solutions also, also support resilience, adaptation, and inclusion. So I'll say in advance, congratulations to the Foresight 50. I don't know who they'll be. Um, and thank you so much for having me today. Thanks. Thank you, Christine. We have a little gift. And uh, Clean O2 makes this incredible carbon soap and also some indigenous teas that we, we give to everyone. So I like to shout those out. Thank you. Thank you. I'll put it here. All right. Um, so thank you, Jackie and Christine. Two quick things before we kick off. We're going to be doing this in groups of 10 because there are 50. And after each 10, we're going to get together for a quick group photo. So if you're called, come on up as you're called and we'll have a little photo op because photo ops are fun. You can share them on social media show off that nice shirt that you're wearing. Um, and after each of the 10 selected, uh, we are going to have a quick uh, two to three minute presentation from one of those uh, award-winning folks. And um, we have randomly selected, it's not technically random, uh, because we've selected women-led uh, ventures for these five presentations today. The reason is that currently one in 10 uh, clean tech companies in Canada are women-led. Uh, I am proud to say that at Foresight, the number is about 25, so we're really pushing hard. Hard, um, but it's just a way for us to recognize uh, uh, the opportunity to make sure that as an investor and as a venture, you're looking at diversity on your teams. So to kick off the first group of 10, I'm going to call up Rock Ripley. Uh, Rock is a partner at Gowling WG uh, with uh, some sponsor remarks. And Rock and I have done a couple of podcasts together. So if you're on LinkedIn, you can chime in and see some of our recordings. And I think we have a couple more coming up. So Rock, over to you. Great. Thank you. I think I commented to Jeanette earlier that I would wait to visit the bar until after I speak, which is just to say, don't worry, these remarks will be brief. <laughs> um, so I was fortunate enough to also be able to say a few words last year. And I realized, reflecting on that, that a lot can change in a year. Um, this year, up until very recently, maybe last night, a lot of the province uh, was in drought conditions. Uh, in contrast, last year, a lot of the province was underwater, including areas about half an hour from here. And then when hearing about all your companies this year, I asked myself, uh, how much have they changed in the past year? Even for those of you that are so-called overnight successes, I suspect you know full well that success is a result of sustained and continuous improvement. It's like compound interest. Today, 
build on what you did yesterday and tomorrow be a little better than you are today. As an intellectual property lawyer, I found the same thing is true for innovation. Groundbreaking revolutionary technologies can often look like they came out of nowhere. But when you dig a little deeper, you notice that they are the result of sustained incremental gains that have compounded over time. So part of our job at Gowling WLG is to help you identify those gains and decide when and how to protect them both domestically and internationally. So thank you and congratulations to the winners. Do I do any of the reading or? Yeah, they're right here. Oh, they're here right under, go, under my very brief <laughs> remarks. Go. Very good. Just the, this part. <laughs> Just this part, got it. So in no particular order, we have Carbon Minerals, Intelligent City, Nanos Tech, Theory Mesh, Solar Stream, Summit Nanotech, Takachar, Terramera, Planetary Technologies, and Hydra Energy. Congratulations to all of you. And I'm going to invite, uh, invite up Jessica from Hydra to give us a little update on what Hydra has been working on. Jess, over to you. Thank you so much, Jeanette, and, and thank you to Foresight for organizing this uh, amazing event of convening the clean tech community after many years apart. It's nice to be in a crowded room with all of you. Um, I just wanted to give you a quick update on, on Hydra. For those that don't know, we have a, a retrofit kit that we install on Class 8 trucks that allows us to run up to 40% hydrogen, saving up to 40% greenhouse gas emissions. Um, for those that don't know, trucking, has not a lot of options to go green right now. So even if they're interested in going green, we still have to make it economic and scalable. And those are not the solutions available today. And that's why Hydra got involved in this challenge was so we could have something that not only technically works, gets the same performance as they would have gotten on diesel, but also that is economic for the fleets who don't have those big margins to play with. They need something that makes economic sense, that's real, uh, and preferably that soon, because we all know the uh, impetus on uh, doing more for the environment. So for us, it was really about bringing something tangible to the fleets that they can do today. Uh, we're currently raising money for our Prince George project, which includes uh, hydrogen production, a fueling station, and the conversion of 65 trucks to run off our kit. The fleets don't pay for the conversion. We pay for that cost up front in exchange for a five-year commitment from the fleet to buy hydrogen at the same price as diesel. So they don't have any upfront costs. They don't have uh, any impact in terms of their fuel price. Uh, and then they also have the fuel economy savings to give them an extra little bump up. So that's where I'll leave it. If you are an investor and interested in discussing more, feel free to grab me in, in the break. Thanks so much again, Jeanette. Thank you. Innovative, innovative business models and innovation. I love it. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Next up, I'm going to give a warm welcome to Anna Pippen from EDC. I've put Anna on the spot to join us this evening and uh, present the next 10 lists. So Anna, I'm going to pass it over to you. You even got that? That was really quick. <laughs> <laughs> that was a very quick um, turnover. So hi, everybody. I'm delighted to present the second block of honorees of this year's Foresight 50. And again, in no particular order, we have Axine Water Technologies, Earthware, GRT, Clean Industries, Livestock Water Recycling, New Life Green Tech, Proteus Waters, Verdi, Veridius Research, and Permulation. Congratulations. Good job. Grab a photo. All right, we're going to jump in for a quick photo and then we'll invite one of these lovely winners for a quick presentation. I want to welcome Tatiana Estevez Carlucci to the stage to share with us more about permulation and their incredible technology. Thank you, everyone. So did you know that by, according to the UN, by 2030, two thirds of the world will not have enough water to cover their needs? There's 14 countries already under extreme drought category, and only in the US, drought has cost over $250 billion. I am Tatiana Estevez, founder and CEO of Permalution, a startup working on fog and cloud water collection technology and innovation. 
So as rain is considered vertical precipitation, fog or clouds are considered horizontal precipitation, and we can get up to three times more water than with rain. By definition, fog or clouds are made of tiny particles of water that are suspended in the air, and we're on a mission to introduce this new water source through our world-class technology comprising three units, the fog atlas, the water radar, and the fog collectors. They are the only modules in the market that are ready to assemble, IoT integrated, and fireproof, able to collect from 150 to 400 liters of water per day, per unit. We have deployed projects in agriculture, conservation, wildfire mitigation, and climate change observation, and the IP belongs fully to Permolution. So we are cheaper or more affordable than desalination plants, we're more efficient than rain, and we're safer than groundwater extraction. So at the moment we're selling services and products, our products are the fog collectors, and our services are fog potential analysis, uh, installation and maintenance, and we're serving B2B and B2G at the moment. Uh, this year we sold our four largest projects so far, uh, we established a production plan near uh, Montreal, Quebec, and um, we have letters of intent for over 250 units. In the near future, we're transitioning our business models to become a water utility service provider where we will incorporate a recurring revenue. Let me breathe, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> yes, thank you. Uh, so we will be transitioning our business model into a recurrent revenue model where we will be selling per parameter or cubic meters of water instead of units of technology. Um, so on average, our projects we have sold on annual income well, around 130K and uh, we have identified 25,000 clients of this type only in North America uh, for an estimated market of 1.5 billion with the vision to expand globally. So um, if we can introduce fog and cloud water in the world, then we can count on a new substantial solution to address the world's current climate and drought challenges. The answer is fog. Thank you. Thank you, that was great. So um, Tatiana and I did a uh, podcast on Clean Tech Forward, so if you want to take a listen, but the concept of pulling fresh water from fog was incredible to me. And uh, I just want to shout out Alan Shapiro, who's here, who did an incredible report on uh, with the team on the realities of the connection between climate and water um, and the fact that 20% of energy usage is actually used to clean water and make it usable for all of us. Moving on, I am now going to highlight, uh, oh, I'm supposed to highlight that last year's Foresight 50 list raised over $593 million within the last uh, 12 months, exactly, to help propel their technologies forward. Um, and of course, uh, as I mentioned early on, this is a process. So this year we had almost 200 applications uh, and these are all vetted by in, in EIRs, mentors, and of course the investment uh, community. I am now going to pass it on to Cliff Mui from uh, IRAP. I always just say IRAP. I never spell out the acronym. There's so many acronyms, but everyone knows IRAP. Um, please, Cliff, welcome. Come on up. This will be your list here. Thanks, Jeanette. I'm uh, very pleased to be here. A room full of like-minded people, all doing good. So, okay, I have to be neutral. It's, it's a rule. <laughs> okay, um, so the honorees, in no particular order, are Agora Energy, Carbon Upcycling Technologies, Carbonet, C. Victus, I hope I pronounced that right, Digital Water Solutions, FredSense, Galat. Tea Technologies, sorry, Galatea. Zila, Light Leaf Solar, and High Wind Emissions Management. Awesome, come on up. Going to welcome up uh, Jessica up, and she's going to give us a little snapshot on High Wood Emissions Management. Jessica, over to you. Hello, everyone. Thanks for having me. Uh, my name is Jessica Schumlich, and I'm the CEO of Highwood Emissions Management. I get up every morning, and I get so excited to help solve some of the world's largest problems of our time, and that's climate change. So our mission at Highwood Emissions Management is to collaborate, innovate, and educate a world to effective cost uh, effective emissions management solutions. So we've seen increasing pressures from investors, from regulatory bodies, from stakeholders, and everyone in between saying we need to decarbonize our economy. 
And we've seen oil and gas companies react to that. In fact, if you look at all the net zero commitments that oil and gas companies have made to date, that results in over $2 trillion. And so how are companies reacting? They're setting these net zero targets, yet according to a new McKinsey study, 15% of only 15% of oil and gas executives actually have robust plans to meet those targets. That's where Highwood's B2B SaaS platform comes into play. Our emissions management toolkit is a series of modules that helps companies both first understand where their emissions are coming from, secondly, build out robust roadmaps to figure out where are the best, most cost-effective solutions, and probably most importantly, track those to show real performance. If you're an oil and gas operator, you could be inundated with thousands of companies coming to you to say, hey, deploy my solution, deploy my solution, deploy my solution. How do you get through the noise? That's where we come in. And so, uh, what's our secret sauce? We understand oil and gas. We come from oil and gas, and we are passionate about helping the industry decarbonize. Um, our team is amazing, too. I'm an oil and gas engineer. I don't understand B2B SaaS, but I've come and I've, <laughs> I've developed a team that uh, understands that and comes from some of the best and most successful SaaS uh, developments to date. So if you are an uh, oil and gas operator and you want education or you want to understand um, how to navigate through this really, really difficult challenge, contact us. If you're an investor, we're currently raising capital. Let's solve climate change and make a little bit of money doing it as well. Thanks so much. Awesome. Thank you, Jessica. So some of the factors we look for in investable businesses, team, business model, value proposition, competitive advantage, and uh, certainly strong product and technology roadmaps, which I think we're seeing presented here all today. Uh, now I'm actually going to call back up Jackie Griffiths, who's going to present uh, the fourth block of our Foresight 50. Jackie, over to you. Thanks, Jeanette. Um, so it's great to be back and the fourth block of honorees uh, to be presented today in no particular order, I want to stress that, uh, Biographene Solutions, Hempalta, Liamazoo, Lucent Biosciences, Farment, Sigriff, Econa Power, Neoka, HTech, and Opticize Solutions. Congratulations. And we are going to hear a little presentation from Andrea Cook, CEO of Opticize Solutions. Andrea, come on up. Thank you. For those of you who don't know Opticize, we specialize in net zero subsurface imaging. Our proprietary software and innovative technologies are utilized to reduce the land footprint and emissions associated with acquiring subsurface images. We are in revenue and have completed 300 projects for 42 clients around the world. Our technology is utilized in the traditional energy space as well as in emerging sectors such as carbon capture and sequestration, the mining of critical minerals for the energy transition, and clean energy applications such as geothermal. These markets are all multi-billion dollar markets and in the carbon capture space, the U.S. has committed 2.5 billion uh, this summer just for carbon capture. That carbon has to go somewhere. The plan is to put 93% of it into the subsurface in geologic formations. These need to be identified and then monitored. Regulations will require monitoring for 40 to 60 years or possibly even longer to ensure safe containment. Identifying, imaging and monitoring these reservoirs is what OptiSize excels in. Our technology uh, was recently developed, it's called EcoSize, and with it we can reduce the land footprint and the emissions associated with these seismic images by more than 50%, all while providing better imaging than conventional technologies. We're comp uh, completing our first pilot with uh, five major energy producers and have gone through full technical validation and are now collecting operational data and tracking data. Um, we've put together a very solid team that has over 250 years of experience in diverse areas such as business and technology development, software, 
academic research and marketing, and we have a strong advisory board who has completed prior successful exits. We have bootstrapped ourselves to this point and are growing steadily, but with your help and your investment, we can grow globally and expand exponentially. I want to thank Foresight for including us in the uh, top 50 companies, and I look forward to talking with you further. Um, we are going to move on to the last but not least to set of uh, 10 companies that are being recognized today. I also want to give a big wave to all of the folks watching in Calgary and Toronto. And of course, I think we have 100 plus folks following along online. So thank you for joining and seeing this all in action. I am now going to call up Keith Gillard, who some of you might know him as the board chair and one of the founders of Foresight, um, currently CEO of Upper Stage Capital. So I'm going to bring Keith up for the final list. That's great. Thank you very much. And uh, just before I uh, get on to that, I want to say this is a 10th year of Foresight. Our, our 10 year anniversary is coming up in April of next year. And although this is only the second time that we've done the Clean Tech 50, I am uh, Foresight 50. I am so proud of everything that Jeanette and her team and all of you have accomplished in the BC and Canadian at large clean tech ecosystem. Thank you so much. All of you are making such a huge impact on this very, very important topic. Thank you. All right. So now I have the pleasure of announcing the fifth and final block. The companies being honored today are Copperstone Technologies, Surltex, Open Ocean Robotics, Corotu, Marine Labs, CO2 Energy, Swift, TechBrew Robotics, Adaptis, and I, I'm afraid I don't know how to pronounce the top one here. Oh, excuse me, Carbon Graph. So, thank you very much. I am going to invite up Sheeta Shahi, co-founder and CEO of Adaptis. Come on over. Hi everyone, thanks so much for having me. Uh, Shada, CEO and co-founder of Adaptus. I'm an architect and I've worked in practice for many years on high performance uh, new construction projects and adaptive reuse projects across Canada. And it's really frustrating how complex, labor intensive and uncertain uh, adaptation projects and high performing new construction uh, design projects can be. Uh, to answer that question, I went back to Waterloo, did a PhD focused on circular engineering, and spent four or five years uh, answering the question of how to optimize a design process and how to improve uh, decarbonization planning for buildings. At Adaptus, uh, we've combined uh, multiple years of research into a de uh, decarbonization decision support platform that helps building owners, uh, decision makers, make informed decisions about how to decarbonize effectively, efficiently, uh, and in a quick manner. Uh, we are, compared to a team of consultants, we can generate 50 times more design options and analyze them using our proprietary algorithms and databases in about 8% of the traditional design time. And uh, so far, we're about 6 to 8% uh, times cheaper uh, than a team of consultants. Uh, to date, over the past six months, uh, we've secured 200K in revenue. Uh, we just closed our pre-seed round uh, for about one and a half million dollars, and we are on a path uh, to grow very quickly. Uh, the market that we're dealing with only focusing on multifamily buildings, um, retrofits, deep uh, adaptive reuse projects. We're looking at an $8 billion market across North America. Um, that we can grow exponentially across the globe in markets that have in place and developing carbon markets. Uh, our competitors are mainly in the space of uh, circularity planning uh, and carbon management uh, consulting teams. Uh, the competition in our field is very fragmented, so there's a huge, huge opportunity here. Um, to summarize, we're a female-led team. We have about 15 years of combined work experience, a lot of um, passion in the field, and we're on track uh, to save a lot of embodied carbon uh, on our path. Thanks so much for having us. All right, thank you. So I think uh, 50 incredible companies supported by five pitches from those representing companies. 
Um, that concludes our Foresight 50 ceremony, but it does not stop the party, which ensues when you grab a beverage and enjoy some snacks. Um, but before we get you there, I just want to really congratulate all the nominees and the honorees. I want to thank the incredible Foresight team who has put in all of the work behind the scenes to make this happen. I also want to shout out Leslie McKinnon who is here somewhere. You can reach her at investors at foresightcac.com if you want to participate in some matchmaking with the ventures. Um, lots of opportunities to be connecting with uh, folks in the room as well as folks within the broader network. I um, want to make sure we thank all of the event sponsors and partners, uh, Invest Vancouver, uh, Gowling, uh, there was a whole list there that I'm going to forget, but um, thank you everyone for your collaboration and your cooperation to make this happen. Um, also want to make sure we thank all the folks live uh, in Calgary and uh, Toronto, as well as folks following along virtually. Um, we tend to have an incredible holiday party. It's been a few years, but if you were at the one on a few years ago it was a blast and we are going to be having a live holiday party again this year on December 15th so please make sure you register uh, there's going to be a holiday party in Vancouver Calgary and the week before in Toronto with some incredible partners on the ground there and you can follow along on our events page if you want to join so on behalf of myself and the entire Foresight team thank you for all the work that you're doing uh, please stay and celebrate connect and have some fun Thank you all.